اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا رب العالمين اللهم أرنا الحق حق وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطل وارزقنا اجتنابه والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we thank Allah azza wa jal for allowing us to reach this moment in the month of Ramadan for indeed it is a blessing and a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he allowed us to witness this much this much of this month this year you know the reality is my brothers and sisters that there's many people and i know you've possibly heard this being said before as well but i think a reminder is, is always good for us there are many people who were here last ramadan and this year they're not here and i could almost tell you with a surety that many of those people did not imagine that they will not get another opportunity to witness the month of Ramadan. The reality is that we don't know which day is the day in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written for us to be freed from the hellfire. We don't know which prayer, which salah, which individual salah it may be that in that salah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed for us to be freed from the hellfire and admitted us into paradise. We don't even know which particular sajda, I mean, let's put the prayer aside for a moment. We don't know what particular sajda is the sajda, that our spirituality is at such a heightened level that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives our sins and we're granted paradise and, and there's precedent for this. We know in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam that people were freed from the hellfire for a single deed. We know of the woman who gave water to the dog that was panting and thirsty the woman climbed into the well, climbed down to the well. She filled her shoe with water. She put it in her mouth, the shoe, because she had to use her arms to climb up. She climbed up out of the well and she gave this thirsty dog water. And there was so much sincerity and rahma, mercy in this action of this woman that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave a very sinful lifestyle of hers. And she was admitted into paradise. And that is why the Prophet وسلم, continuously reminded us of Deeds that we think are small deeds. لا تحقرن من المعروف شيئا. Never belittle anything from goodness. ولو أن تلقى أخاك بوجه طليق. Even if it's you smiling in the face of your brother, and we hear this all the time, right? It's sunnah to smile and so on and so forth. But how many of us truly like think about that smile as a deed that will free us from the hellfire? The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, he said, اتقوا النار. He said, save yourself, protect yourself from the hellfire. Even if it's with a piece or portion of a date, meaning that's all you have to give in charity. And I know sometimes, you know, we live in certain communities and we have like the big donors, mashallah, tabarakallah. You know, I'm not going to say who, what profession, <laughs> doctors, <laughs> excuse me. Certain professions, alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed them with wealth and the ability to support our communities. And sometimes we may look at those amounts, and especially like the students among us, amongst us, we may look at those amounts, and we look in our pocket, and we look at our $5 or $10, and we say to ourselves, like, what is my $5 going to do? And now I know there's a lot of fundraisers taking place for our brothers and sisters in, in Gaza, and the unimaginable horrors that our brothers and sisters are facing. And sometimes when it comes to giving charity, or it, even when it comes to making dua for our brothers and sisters, we think to ourselves, what is my dua going to do? The superpowers have united against these people. The people in charge, they have united against them. What is my 5 or $10 in charity and aid going to do? Sometimes you think, is my aid even going to get there? But the reality is, my brothers and sisters, that our reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not dependent upon the success of our action. Our reward is dependent upon two things. Number one, is what we are doing correct and good? And number two, are we doing it with sincerity? Are we doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If those conditions are met, then our reward is secure with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah tells us, إِنَّهُ مَنْ يَتَّقِي وَيَصْبِرْ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَضِيعُ أَجْرَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ That a person who has taqwa, God consciousness, meaning that's their intention when they're acting, what they're doing in life, it's for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have, إِنَّهُ مَنْ يَتَّقِي وَيَصْبِرْ and then they have, they, they have patience, perseverance, because doing the right thing is not always easy. 
And in most cases, it's actually very difficult. And doing the right thing means we're going to face a lot of opposition. We're going to face backlash. We're going to face those who want to bring us down, whether it be physically or verbally or even emotionally. And this is all, these are all matters that all the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala face, that type of opposition. And this particular verse is mentioned with Yusuf, and it deals with the story of Yusuf alayhi salam, with all the opposition and difficulties that he faced alayhi salam. But you know what's interesting about the story of Yusuf alayhi salam? It was sent as a, uh, it, was, it was sent to console the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Because when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi received Surah Yusuf and the verses of Yusuf alayhi salam, jazakallah khair, it was a very difficult time for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Because his own people had turned against him. His own family members and his community had turned against him. People that he'd known his whole life. And imagine what that would feel like. These are people that are your family and you've grown up with them. They're your friends. They're your relatives. And you're known in society as being like the most trustworthy person. The most reliable person. The most honest person. Al-Amin, he was, he was known as. And then with the flip of a switch, now people are calling you a liar. They're calling you a soothsayer. And they're saying you are breaking apart our families. You're breaking ties of kinship. That was deeply hurtful for the Prophet ﷺ to see his own community turn against him. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comforted the Prophet ﷺ. And one of the ways that Allah comforted the Prophet ﷺ was through the story of Yusuf ﷺ. Because if you look at the story of Yusuf ﷺ, at every step of the way, it seemed that everything was going against him. But what did not change for Yusuf ﷺ was those two factors. Taqwa, God consciousness, working for the sake of Allah, being sincere to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and patience. Patience as in perseverance. And I think sometimes uh, patience is, a, is, a, is not the best translation for the word sabr. Because we think patience, you know, it's almost like something is, is not tangible for us. And we hear that as a statement, people like, just be patient. Even, even in Arabic, he's like, isbir, and like a parent, when they says isbir to their child, the child's like, okay, fine. Right? But what does that mean? What that means is persevere. Can you outlast the harm and the difficulty and the challenges that you're facing? Because if you can outlast it, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never allow our reward to be lost. And one of my favorite hadith of the Prophet ﷺ is a hadith that deals with the day of judgment. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, uh, uh, He said, if, if the day of judgment is starting... And you have in your hand a fasil. Fasila is basically, to put it simply, is, is the ability to plant a tree or plant a plant. Right? You have in your hand the ability to plant something, to plant a tree. The Prophet wasallam said that if you're able to plant it, put it in the ground before the day of judgment actually starts, فَلْيَغْرِسْهَا like, Then put it in the ground. Why? We would think if we look at it from a logical perspective, it doesn't make any sense. Like why, you would plant something, you would plant a tree, like why do we plant a tree? Well, to see the tree grow and to get shade from the tree and you want fruit to come from the tree and there's benefits of planting that. that those are worldly benefits. That's worldly success. That's how we define success in this life. We see some type of change taking place, right? I worked hard and I saw this change. I worked hard and I became a doctor or a lawyer or this or that, whatever. I worked hard, I accomplished this, I got that position. That's how we define worldly success. So in terms of worldly success, it makes no sense to plant that tree. So why did the Prophet ﷺ said, say to us that if you have that ability to put it in the ground before the day of judgment starts, put it in the ground? Because our reward is secure with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning if you have the ability, and this is, the, this is, the, this is the, the larger meaning here, if you have the ability to gain reward before the day of judgment starts, then do it. Don't worry about the outcome. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of the outcome. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of his believers. Whether it be projects that we're doing in this life, whether it be, like I said, even looking at our brothers and sisters in Gaza, in, in Palestine, in Sudan, uh, in China, and all these places, and sometimes it can be very disheartening for us because we begin to think like, and, and you know, this whispering from the shaitan that like, we're not going to see any change. We're not going to see victory. We're not going to see any real change take place. And indeed, that is not our responsibility. 
our responsibility is to do the best we can do. To use the resources that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us to do the best that we can do. And we will be judged according to what we have been given. Right? Just like the charity that I spoke about, someone who has the ability to donate $100,000, Allah has given this person that ability, they will be questioned about that ability to give $100,000. But if Allah has given you the ability to give only, and I say only in quotation marks, $50, then you're judged on those $50. Right? To one person, that $50 may be everything. They're judged on, on that. Not on the success of the project. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of his believers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah azza wa jal has reminded the believers. We find uh, in Surah Ali Imran, it's very relevant to what's happening in the world today because in Surah Ali Imran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the battle of, uh, of Uhud. And the battle of Uhud was a very difficult battle for the believers because in that battle, they suffered a lot of loss, many losses. It was difficult. And this is coming from Badr, which was like a, a clear, clear victory and success for the believers. They're very high spirits. And in the battle of Uhud, they see people dying. They see the Prophet ﷺ himself being injured. And we see the mushrikun, they were boasting about their success and their victory and their power over the believers. So the, the verses in Surah Ali Imran are very comforting. They were comforting for the companions and actually comforting for us as well. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has reminded the believers do not become weak. If you're facing difficulty, if you're facing challenges, if you're facing losses, which is the reality of what's happening right now, do not make that make you stagnant. Because you suffered loss, so what happens is sometimes when we don't get what we, the, the victory that we desire, that we worked so hard for, then we, we can be overcome with a sense of dread. And that is that huzn. That's the second part. Like that, that feeling of grief. And that grief makes us stagnant. When we feel that grief, we're like, there's no point. I remember, subhanAllah, um, before Ramadan, being at a march in, in D.C. I, I live in Maryland, very close to, to D.C. And there's like a major march uh, in D.C. And I was, I was with my wife, uh, you know, some friends, and I said, subhanAllah, like 10 years ago, you know, we walked by, we walked right in front of the White House, like the march went in front of the White House. And I'll tell you, my brothers and sisters, like my house is about 30, 40 minutes from the White House. The only time I've been to the White House in my whole life is during like a Palestine march. Because I'm like, eh, you know, like, it's like people who live in New York, right? You ask them like, have you been to the Statue of Liberty? And they'll say, no, but it's like, it's right there, right? You, you just, you're driving past and you see it every day. And like, New Yorkers don't actually, most New Yorkers that I know, don't actually go make a special trip to go to the Statue of Liberty. I'd imagine, uh, what do y'all have here? The CN Tower, right? I don't think people from Toronto, what's the phrase for people from Toronto? What are they called? Torontonians, is that right? I messed that up, didn't I? Or is that right? That's right? Okay. Torontonians probably aren't super interested in going to the CN Tower, but somebody comes and visits from out of town, they're like, we want to go to the CN Tower. You're like, fine, we'll take you to the CN Tower, right? Because you're just used to it. So walking from the White House, I was like, yeah, this is, I think, the, the third time in my life that I've actually been so close to the White House and it's only during a march. And the last time I was, I was here was like 10 years ago. Like 10 years ago, we were here with the same march, the same signs, that, you know, that uh, this occupation has been there. This is not something which is new. And once again, we can be overcome with this sense of dread. Like, I don't see the results that I've been working towards. But we have to remind ourselves with the reminder of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that when, when you're not seeing success and victory in terms of this dunya, because why? Because you will be victorious. But there's a caveat. There's a condition that needs to be met. The condition is, in kuntum mu'minin. And that is the difference between a Muslim and a non-Muslim when it comes to working for any cause. You know, we talk about um, you know, civil rights and human rights and so on and so forth. We talk about um, you know, social justice work and all that. Like, what's the difference between a, a Muslim social justice worker or activist and a non-Muslim? Well, if we're looking at it, only success in this dunya, then, yeah, there's no difference. The difference is that a believer 
Their success is not defined by, did I get the exact result that I wanted? For a believer, their success is defined by, am I doing the right thing? And am I doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The difference is that a believer at the end of the day, they go home and they stand in qiyam. They stand for the night prayer. They stand, إِذَا فَرَغْتَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet إِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ وَإِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ فَرْغَبْ that once you're done, and this is an instruction to the Prophet Sallam, once you're done making the effort in this life, Prophet Sallam made da'wah, called people to goodness, and you know, recited the Quran to them, and called people to goodness. But in the end of the day, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, when you're done with that, when you you did you put in the work, right? فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ When you're done, stand up, right? Get upright. وَإِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ فَرْغَبْ and and have that yearning from your Lord. Because success comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's, that's the difference between a believer and someone who is working just for this worldly gain or this worldly benefit. So I say all of this, my brothers and sisters, because as we get to the end of the month of Ramadan, we don't want to be in a position where all the success we've made and all the progress we've made during the month of Ramadan, that we allow it to go to waste. Number one, we still have time. And I know, once again, usually after the night of the 27th, people tend to believe that Ramadan is over. And we don't know where our forgiveness lies. It may lie in the last moments, minutes of the month of Ramadan. Especially when the announcement is made for Eid. And I know these days, like it's said, I don't know how it works here, but many communities, like Eid is announced like a year ahead of time, right? But back in my day, <laughs> I sound old. Back in my day, when we would look at the moon, right? Um, it's like once that announcement was made, it's like everybody's khalas, like let's go, like it's, it's time to like party, right? But it may be that we got an, an announcement and, and it's not Maghrib time yet, right? We got maybe inter international moon sighting and I really didn't plan to talk about moon sighting. I, I'm, I'm sorry for even bringing that up. But <laughs> maybe someone saw the moon in, in a, you know, a different country or whatever it may be and we got the announcement, but we still have time. Like the day is not over yet. We're still in the month of Ramadan. Yeah, maybe an hour, maybe 20, 30 minutes, but the month of Ramadan is still there. And we may be falling victim to the praise, to the attack of the shaitan. That the shaitan says, done, you're victorious. You know, Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah ta'ala, it's been narrated that when he was on his deathbed, he was surrounded by his children. And his children kept saying to him, to say the shahada. They were saying to him, قُلْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Which is the, the sunnah to gently instruct the person to, to, to say the shahada. And, and by the way, um, when we instruct someone to say the shahada when they're on their deathbed, we want to do it in a very gentle way. I, I've seen some people get very forceful, subhanAllah, say لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ and, the, and this person who's in the throes of death may even be you know, um, saying it with their, with their lips, like mouthing it. But a person says, I didn't hear it. I got to hear it. Like there has to be a'lan. Like, no, no, no. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the person the tawfiq to say the shahada, alhamdulillah, you accept that. That's a bushra. That's a good sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't, we don't urge the person. But the point is that the children of Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah ta'ala, they were, they, were, they were saying to him, say la ilaha illallah. And Imam Ahmed was replying la. He was saying no. And they would say, say la ilaha illallah. He would say la ba'd, not yet. Not yet. La ba'd, la ba'd, not yet, not yet. And so he was in the throes of death and he was in and out of consciousness. And he regained consciousness at one point and his children say to him, we were telling you, we were instructing you to say la ilaha illallah and you kept saying no. What was happening? What's going on? And Imam Ahmad said that when I was in that state, the shaitan came to me. And the shaitan was saying, you have won. You're victorious. You're going to Jannah. That's it. The battle's over. And Imam Muhammad was saying, La ba'd, not yet. Not yet. In, the, in his final moments, he knew this may be the time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants him Jannah. So he did not let his guard down until the very last moment. And we know as the Prophet وسلم, he said, al bil khawatim, That matters are judged by their ending. And this is, a, this is, this is a, a beautiful hadith of the Prophet it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's incredibly uplifting because 
as we get to the end of the month of Ramadan, sometimes people look back at their Ramadan and they feel like guilty. Sometimes people have feelings of shame attached to their Ramadan, which is the exact opposite of what is supposed to happen in Ramadan. Ramadan is supposed to be an uplifting time for us. Ramadan is a time where we prove to ourselves that we are spiritual beings and we have the ability to do a lot more than what we've been doing the rest of the year. I've been getting up for Fajr, alhamdulillah, I didn't do that all year. But I know I can do it because in Ramadan I did it. I know I can fast. I'm not good at fasting the rest of the year. But in Ramadan, I, I saw that I could do it. I saw in the month of Ramadan that I was able to stand out and be proud as a Muslim because I was fasting. And my coworkers or my you know, fellow students or whatever it may be, you know, they're like, why aren't you eating? And I'm like, you're like, I'm fasting. And you, yeah, you stood out. It seemed strange to some people. But you took honor in that. You're proud to be Muslim. That proved to you, it proves to us that we have the ability to, to do that. So this is a month of, 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 of it's, a, it's a month where we see our success, our spiritual success. And so it's, it's very counterproductive that we get to the end of the month of Ramadan, we look back and say, you know what? I didn't do too well. And we want to hide away or shy away. And the reality is that it is about finishing strong. That's what Ramadan is about. Our goal in Ramadan is make every day better than the last. That's it. So today is better than the last. I, I gave a talk last night. Uh, it's the night of the 27th. And the whole talk was about, and this is like, I try to preempt the night. We spoke about, what if tonight was your last night? How would your dua change? How would your prayer change? How would your salah change? How would what you need from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala change? What type of dua would you be making if this was your last night. And the reality is that we don't know. You know, once again, we look at our brothers and sisters in, in Gaza and they're, they're, an, they're, a, they're an ayah for us. They're a sign for us. Because for them, death is very, very real. Because it is so visceral for them, right? But for us, we may not feel that way because we feel safe and secure. And the reality is that just like the people of Gaza, do not have the next moment guaranteed. Likewise, none of us have the next moment guaranteed either. So if this was our last night of the month of Ramadan, how would we finish? What would we do on this night? How would we treat the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You know, the, the, the month of Ramadan, as we know, is the month of the Quran. Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Quran, the month of Ramadan which the Quran was revealed. This is the month where we honor the Quran, honor the Quran in ways that Perhaps, maybe we were not doing before the month of Ramadan. You know, Imam Malik, rahimahullah ta'ala, who was the Imam of Medina in his time, he was, people would travel from all over the world to come and just sit with Imam Malik and they would just want to, people, some people would travel all the way just to hear one hadith. Because they wanted to be able to say, Haddathani Malik. That Malik narrated to me. That was like an honor, like a badge of honor to say, I sat with Imam Malik and I heard a hadith. And so Imam Malik, his, his halaqa, his, his, uh, his lessons would be full of people. And he would teach hadith. And he would teach other sciences of the Quran, uh, sciences of Islam. But when the month of Ramadan came, his students say that he would put everything else aside. And he would only teach the Quran. He would only focus on the Quran. We know in the hadith of Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhu ma mentioned Sahih Bukhari, he says that, in the month of Ramadan, the Prophet ﷺ would review the whole Qur'an with the angel Jibreel. And then he says that in the last year, in the year the Prophet ﷺ passed away, he reviewed the Qur'an twice with the angel Jibreel. And so, yes, alhamdulillah, we've been focusing on, on the Qur'an. But what have we learned from the Qur'an? What have we taken from the Qur'an? The reality is, when it comes to our relationship with the Qur'an, we only fall in, in one of two categories. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam reminded us Al-Qur'an hujjatun laka aw alayk. The Qur'an is a proof for you or a proof against you. Or another way to understand this is the Qur'an is a witness for you or the Qur'an is a witness against you. There's no, there's no third party. There's no neutral party when it comes to the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ we send the Qur'an and from the Qur'an there is that which is healing and mercy for who? Lil mu'minin for the believers. That's camp one. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَلَا يَزِيدُ الظَّالِمِينَ إِلَّا خَسَارًا 
As for the, the transgressors, the wrongdoers, the oppressors, the Qur'an only increases them in loss. This is why we have uh, the statement of Qatada, one of the tabi'un. He said that no one sits with the Qur'an except that it either increases them or decreases them. And we have other scholars saying that a person, when they come and sit with the Qur'an, they're never the same. Never the same. When they approach the Qur'an and they sit with the Qur'an, they're never the same after that. Either they approach the Qur'an with iman, with faith, with wanting to learn from the Qur'an, with wanting to be healed by the Qur'an. Or they approach the Qur'an with their eyes and their ears closed. And this person goes away from the Qur'an suffering loss. One of the early scholars he said, and it's very scary, subhanAllah, to actually hear this. He said, perhaps a person sits with the Qur'an. And the Qur'an, as this person is reciting the Qur'an, the Qur'an, the Qur'an is actually cursing this person. How is that possible? Well, it can happen when a person, for example, is reading the Qur'an, reciting the Qur'an. And Allah is mentioning something in the Qur'an. Allah is giving a warning, for example. And this person is reciting that warning. But they themselves are involved in that very thing that they're reciting. A very good example of this is riba, interest. There may be a person who is reciting the Qur'an and reciting the verses of interest. Allah says that there's an announcement of war with Allah and His Messenger, the person who does not leave interest. And so a person is reciting this, yet they're not paying heed. It doesn't make a difference to them. And this is something that the Prophet ﷺ actually this is something that was deeply hurtful to the Prophet ﷺ, that those people who hear the Qur'an and they don't take anything away from it. It doesn't, it doesn't affect them. It doesn't change them. And the Prophet ﷺ actually complained to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah tells us this document in the Qur'an. وَقَالَ رَبِّي إِنَّ قَوْمِي اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا He said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah tells us that my Lord... Inna qawmi, my people have abandoned this Qur'an. Now, is this speaking about Muslims? No, it's not speaking about Muslims. Who is it speaking about? It's speaking about the mushrikun of that time, the Quraysh. And, but you have to look at what was happening. What was happening was that they would listen to the Qur'an. They, not only would they listen to the Qur'an, right? We could say a person, you know what, they listen but they don't understand. Okay, So therefore, they, they, don't, they don't pay heed to it. The Quraysh understood the Qur'an. They understood the language. So why did the Prophet ﷺ say they have abandoned the Qur'an? Because they did not take guidance from it. They did not take those warnings seriously. They, they lived their life in the opposition of that Qur'an. And so we have to ask ourselves, where do we fall in those two categories? Are we that category that is going to move on after the month of Ramadan and we are going to be those who come on the day of judgment and the Qur'an comes as a witness for us? How does the Qur'an come as a witness for us? It's very simple, my brothers and sisters. The Qur'an comes as a witness for us when we are able to live our lives by the Qur'an. When we are not just hearing and listening, but we are acting upon what we are hearing and listening to in the Qur'an. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this is a hadith mentioned in Sahih Muslim, he said, يُؤْتَ بِالْقُرْآنِ يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ The Qur'an will be brought on the day of judgment. وَأَهْلِي And the people of the Qur'an. Jazakallah khair. Thank you. And the people of the Qur'an will be brought as well. So now, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, the Qur'an will be brought, وَأَهْلِي And the people of the Qur'an. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam defined who the people of the Qur'an are. الَّذِينَ كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ بِهِ Those who would act upon the Qur'an, live the Qur'an, those who would act upon the Qur'an. We think, when we hear Ahlul Qur'an, what do we think? We think Huffad, right? May Allah make us from amongst the Ahlul Qur'an and the Huffad, make them from Ahlul Qur'an. But the Ahlul Qur'an are not Huffad by default. One of our scholars of the past, he said that a Hafiz, may come on the Day of Judgment and the Qur'an comes as a witness against this Hafiz of the Qur'an. And another person comes and they have just a few surahs memorized from the Qur'an, a few short surahs from the Qur'an memorized. But the Qur'an comes as a witness for this person. How? 
Well, even though the first person was a hafiz of the Qur'an, they had the Qur'an memorized, they did not act upon any of the Qur'an. And so now the Qur'an comes. يُؤْتَى Quran. The Qur'an is brought as a witness and it testifies against this hafiz of the Qur'an. May Allah protect us. And then the other person who only memorized a little bit of the Qur'an, but they were sincere with the Qur'an. They made sure that even though they weren't able to memorize, maybe this person didn't have the best recitation, they didn't have the best pronunciation. And from dunya perspective, once again, we may look at this person and be like, yeah, you know what? I don't know. But this person struggled with the Qur'an. They struggled with reciting the Qur'an, but that, rest, that struggling with the Qur'an raised their status because we know we're rewarded every time we struggle to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Specifically, the Qur'an is mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet as well. But their status is raised in that way. And also, everything they recited from the Qur'an, they made sure to make an effort to understand what they're reciting and to implement in their lives what they're understanding. To do tadabbur of the Qur'an, to contemplate the Qur'an. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنِ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Allah tells us. Do they not contemplate the Qur'an? Meaning, is it enough that we just recite the Qur'an and we're like, I'm done? Is it enough that we memorize the Qur'an? No. If memorizing the Qur'an is taking place of acting upon the Qur'an, we have been deluded. Because yes, visually that, that may look good. We may feel good. But the reality is that if a person is not living their life by the Qur'an, there's something which is missing. And so as we approach the end of this month, we want to make a conscious effort that we don't leave the Qur'an in the month of Ramadan. That we don't go back to a life where the Qur'an is, I like to say, it's kind of like a flourish on our lives. It's like a decoration piece for some people. Right? It's, it's like, it's around. You know, you have a decoration piece in the house. You may have spent a lot of money on it and you put it in your house. It's there. You look at it. It feels good. But that's about it. It's a very passive relationship. Right? Is that how the Qur'an is for us? Or is the Qur'an the miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we have access to? Allah says, إِنَّ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ يَهْدِي لِلَّتِي هِيَ أَقْوَمْ This Qur'an, yani هذا القرآن, the Qur'an that you hold in your hands, the Qur'an that you recite upon your tongues and your lips, the Qur'an that you have been given access to, this is the most correct, or it is more correct than anything else. And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we become from the people of the Qur'an. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make the Qur'an a means for us to enter paradise. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept all of our salah and our dua and our qiyam and our Qur'an in this blessed month. Allahumma ameen. Hada wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.